23rd of Rajab. Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, the 23rd of Rajab. It's the Wednesday, the 24th. On the next class concerning the mistakes of the Musalleen in this dars. Is that now we begin to get into the essence of the topic. Dealing with some of the issues that people should be reminded of from the mistakes that we make as it relates to prayer. And the salat, kama ta'lamun, everybody knows, it's the most important ibadah from the ibadat al-amaliya in the religion of Islam. There's no ibadah more important than the salat. يَقُولُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ الصَّلَاةُ خَيْرُ مَوْضُوعُ فَمَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ أَنْ يَسْتَكْثِرْ فَلْيَسْتَكْثِرْ The prayer is the best thing that you can do. So whoever has the ability to make more, let him make more. So the shahid is that the salat is the best thing. It's more important than بِرْ الْوَالِدَيْنِ It's more important than الدَّعْوَةِ إِنَ اللَّهِ It's more important than Hajj and jihad It's more important than any of the ibadat in al-Islam. It's the first thing that the person is going to be questioned about يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ So has to do his best, inshallah, she has to do her best to try to get the mechanics right. So there are many issues that people make mistakes on, issues that people may not even know. So we're doing this class, bidinillah, in order to make a tanbih and the tafkir, to remind the community of these issues. First issue we want to deal with today is the mistake of a person making his niyyah with his lisan before he prays. And I'm pretty confident, I'm pretty sure that everybody here, jullukum, jullukum, illam yakun kullukum. Everybody here, he doesn't have to write a single note because everybody here knows, walhamdulillah, that making your niyyah with your tongue is a bid'ah. It is an innovation in the religion of Al-Islam and it has nothing to do with the prayer. There's no ibadah from the ibadat of Al-Islam where a person says, with his tongue, I intend to do this, I intend to do that. If he wants to make wudu, he just makes wudu. Because the first point, the fact that he went to the water basin, to the sink, and he prepared to make wudu, that's his niyyah in and of itself. As we said many times, al-af'alu ablagu min al-aqwal. Actions are more profound. They're more powerful than the words. So when an individual goes to make wudu, when he walks to the masjid, when he stands in the saf, in the line, all of those indications of what his niyyad is. No one is going to stand in the prayer, stand up for prayer, and then his mind wanders off and comes back to him and he says, oh, I'm here, I think I'm going to make the salah. He already has the niyyad for that. All of the ulama of al-Islam, from the major scholars, what you can write is that is ittifaq. All of the scholars of al-Islam said that this has nothing to do with the religion. The four imams, al-imam Abu Hanifa, al-imam Malik, al-imam al-Shafi, al-imam Ahmed, rahmatullahi alayhim ajma'in, they all said that this is not from our religion. The people who do it from the madhabs, they're not following the madhab or the speech of the imam. They're following the speech of other people who came after the imma. The great scholar and imam Abu Dawood, Abu Dawood, a Sajistani, who has the book of al-Hadith, the sunan of an imam Abu Dawood, he asked al-imam Ahmed rahimahullahu ta'ala, when a person wants to pray, should he do the niyyah? Should he say the niyyah? I intend this, I intend that. Al-Imam Ahmed said, la, don't do that. It is an innovation. So in the book, Masail, Al-Imam Ahmed, the issues that were raised up to Al-Imam Ahmed, it was clear that this was his position. Al-Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullahu ta'ala, he said, the one who makes this niyyah, before the prayer or before wudu, it is a sign and indication of his ignorance about the religion. Or it's a sign and indication that something is, rain, something is wrong with his intellect. Because no one does that. 
So we don't want to spend a lot of time seeing which imam said, what imam said. There are a lot of imma that mention this issue. The important thing is, why did they say it? Why did they say that? There's no proof for this. They said it because there are proofs that oppose it. The people who say you should do this, they use the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu The actions are done. The actions will be judged based upon your intention. So because you're about to pray, you should make that intention. Hey, this ibadah of sitting to give the lesson, sitting to receive the lesson is ibadah. That same hadith is applicable to this dars. So do I sit here and I say, I intend to give this dars to the people after Salat al-Maghrib on the 23rd of Rajab, sitting in Green Lane Masjid, and you have to sit there and you say, I intend to sit with the knee of listening to this dars after Salat al-Maghrib in the month of Rajab, and so forth and so on. So if you don't do it for this class, which is ibadah, you don't do it for wudu, you don't do it for ghusl, you don't do it for hajj, you don't do it for umrah, you don't do it for nikah, you don't do it for anything. And from that is a salah We find proofs to dispel this myth and this misconception and this mistake. From them is what was collected by Al-Imam Muslim, Rahimullah Ta'ala, the authority of our mother, Humayra, Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. Qalat, kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yastaftihu salat bit takbir. She said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would start his prayer off with the takbir. And she didn't mention anything about this niyat. So some people, when they start their prayer off, they start it. I intend to make this salat behind this imam and so forth and so on. If that was the start of the Prophet's prayer, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the companions would have mentioned it. Our mother Aisha, who was close to him, saw him pray, heard him pray, especially inside of the house. She said he used to start off the prayer with a takbir. Allahu Akbar. Didn't mention anything about this niyyah or the talaffuz with the niyyah. Another example is the famous hadith, Al-Masih Salatuhu, the man who made a mistake in his prayer. And it's important, Ikhwani, that you guys find this hadith and you read this hadith. The man came into the masjid and the Prophet was sitting. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the man came and he prayed a salat without any discipline. He prayed very quickly without making rukur correctly, without making qiyam correctly without making sajda correctly. After completing that prayer, he went and said, As-salamu alaykum, ya Rasulullah. He said, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Go back and pray. You didn't pray. The man went back. He did the same thing because he didn't really know what he was doing. He wasn't paying attention to the importance of having discipline, concentration. He went back, As-salamu alaykum, ya Rasulullah. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Go back and pray. You didn't pray. And it happened three times. When the man went to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the third time, the man, alhamdulillah, in a show, in a sign of humility, he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I know. This is my prayer. Teach me. So in this man's prayer, he made many mistakes. He made many mistakes. So when we talk about the mistakes in the prayer, this class is from the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, reminding the people about the mistakes in their prayers. So he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, إِذَا قُمْتَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَأَسْبَغِ الْوُضُوءِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقْبِلَ الْقِبْلَةِ ثُمَّ كَبِّرْ ثُمَّ اقْرَأْ مَا تَيَسْرَ مَعْكَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ If you want to pray, then make a good wudu. And the good wudu, as I mentioned before, when we talk about the mistakes of the prayer, every ibadah from the ibadat of al-Islam, these worships, they have things that come before the worship. You just don't start fasting the month of Ramadan. There are things you should do before Ramadan. In the month of Rajab, in the month of Sha'ban, you make preparation for Ramadan. You start fasting in the month of Ramadan. You start learning about Ramadan in the month of Rajab. You just don't go and you make Hajj and that's it. You have to give people back their haq that you took from them. You have to ask people, forgive me, I'm about to go to Hajj. 
I don't want to go to Hajj. And over my head is Zulm. So the Salat, there are Muqaddimat, things that come before the Salat. From the Muqaddimat is what you're wearing, the place you're going to pray, the wudu, all of those issues. So he told that man who made mistakes. Now this is a man who didn't know how to pray. He said to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you want to pray, Ya Abdullah, they make a good wudu. Good wudu means you hit all of the parts. You follow the sunnah. You don't waste water. Don't turn the water both sides of the tap on and you're combining hot and cold. And you're wasting the water where more than 80 people could have made wudu with you, with that water. That's good wudu. Good wudu is make sure you do what you're supposed to do. Do the tartib. Sometimes do one. Sometimes do two. Sometimes do three. He said, if you want to pray, Ya Abdullah, make a good wudu. And then face the qibla. And then say, Allahu Akbar. And then read what is easy for you from the Quran. So the point here in this hadith as a delil is the fact that he never told the man, make your niyat. And as Allah said about the Prophet wasallam, and he said about his religion, your Lord was not forgetful. The Prophet didn't forget to tell this man who needed to know, the man needed to know at that moment. If the niyat is from Islam, he needed to know. The Prophet didn't mention to him, wasallam, purify your niyat. Make a good niyat. He didn't say that. He said, if you want to pray, make good wudu, you must face the qibla. You must say, Allahu Akbar, and then read what is easy for you from the Quran. Number three, and lastly, is the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah ta'ala be pleased with him, he said, رَأَيْتُ النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِفْتَتَحَ الْتَكْبِيَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he began his prayer, he said Allahu Akbar and that was it. So again, ikhwani, I remember when I became a Muslim, 1986, and the books that were at my disposal were the books that had came out of Pakistan, India, and that area. And they used to have illustrations and used to have transliteration. And they used to put a lot of emphasis on you must make the niyat. And the African-American brother who was teaching me how to pray, he put a lot of emphasis on it. Every time I would go to him to see how much I had learned in trying to grow and help me to develop, he was putting emphasis on this issue. There is no dalil in the book of Allah or in the sunnah that you have to make the niyyah. And I'm happy to say, alhamdulillah, that everybody here knows that. Alhamdulillah. But there are those people who don't know. So for those who our words are hidden them, and it is coming to them. Ya Abdullah, Ya Amatullah, Ma Alika and Niya, at Talafuf bin Niya. You don't have to make the Niya with your tongue. Especially for you English speaking new readers. We're going to read Surah Al Fatiha. And we don't know Arabic, so we have to learn how to read. It's in English. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And you do your best. So that's difficult in and of itself. To memorize Sabbih isma rabbik al-a'la In English It's difficult And you won't read it correctly The way it's supposed to be read Because it's transliteration Now we're going to add on to that That we're going to tell the person You have to also learn first No way to an usalli salat al-dhuhr Fardan khalf hadha al-imam Fi hadha al-masjid al-mubarak Iqtida Hey, hey Relax Take it easy Next mistake Ikhwani is the mistake of leaving off, raising your hands in the salah. We want to welcome Ibrahim Ba from Gambia. Alhamdulillah. Ahlan wa sahlan, Ustad Ibrahim. Leaving off. Ruf uliya deen. The scholars of Islam in the past, the great scholars of Islam, they used to put this mas'ala in their books of Aqidah. Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri used to put this issue in his book about Aqidah, showing that the people of Ahlul Hadith, the people of Al Athar, the people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'at, so many these people run around and they are from the madhab of the Ashairah, Ma Turidi. 
and they make a big hoopla about we're the real Ahlul Hal, Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Sunnah. You people are not Ahlul Sunnah. You people are Ahlul Sunnah, meaning you're not from the Shiite, but you're not from Ahlul Sunnah. The people take the Sunnah. The ulama of Ahlul Sunnah, they were on this issue, and again, they will write these things in their books. Al Imam Al Bukhari, he has a book. Al Juz fi Raf al Yadain. He wrote a book about the importance of Raf al Yadain. And the reason why he wrote that book was a rad. It was a refutation on the people of Al Kufa. Most of them were from the Hanafi Madhab. We're not against the Ahnaf as we tried to be balanced, and we told you many times. Al Imam Abu Jafar al Tahawi was Hanafi, Al Iz ibn Abdul Salam was Hanafi. Al Imam Abu Hanifa was from the ulama of Al Islam. But there's no ma'asum except the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Raf al Yadain should be done in your prayer, Ya Abdullah, in four situations. Four. You should do Raf al Yadain when you begin your prayer. Allahu Akbar, first one. When you want to go into your first ruku' Allahu Akbar, and you go into ruku' When you stand up and you come up from ruku' back into qiyam, sami Allah liman hamida, Allahu Akbar, Rabbana lak alhamd, and you raise up your hands. And then after the tashahud, at tahiyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat, when you stand up for the third rakat, you're going to do the fourth raf'u liyadin. These are the four places of raf'u liyadin. The people who reject this, ajib lahum. Now, I do believe, Ikhwani, that following a madhab and being upon a madhab without being muta'asib, without being muta'azib, hardcore, you won't move one inch off of the madhab? No. Kalla. Don't do that. But following the madhab as a systematic way to arrive to conclusions, no problem. But when the truth comes and it's against your madhab or your madhab is against the truth, then leave the madhab and take the truth. If you're like that, then no problem. Problem with these madhabs, people who follow them and the way that they follow them. And this issue is an issue that is gharib, ajib. Because the madhab of the ahna, for an example, they says you shouldn't do raf al yadain, the people rely on fabricated hadith. There's a hadith that they made up. It says, Man Anyone who raises his hand in prayer, he doesn't have a prayer. As if Raf al Yadain destroys your prayer. And it's the Sunnah. Some of them describe Raf al Yadain as a bid'ah. They make up all kinds of stories. In the beginning of Al Islam, in the beginning of Islam, or at some point in Al Islam, in the beginning, the companions used to have idols under their arms. They used to have idols that they used to worship. So when they would pray, the Prophet told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in all of those authentic hadith that they can't reject, but they have to explain it away. Yes, in the beginning, Raf al Yadain was okay when they were in Mecca, and there was no Salat in Mecca. There was no Salat in Mecca. Salat was legislated in Medina, so they used to have idols under their arms. So the Prophet told them, say, Allahu Akbar, and the idols would fall down. You make it, hey, that's takalluf. What are, you, what are you talking about? So they use a hadith, no delil for them. The hadith is not authentic, fabricated, weak. All they use, authentic hadith, but out of context, out of their place, out of their place. You should know, for those of you who are writing, Khamsun min as sahaba 50, 5, 0, narrated the a hadith of Raf al Yadain. 50 of the companions. You're not going to find too many hadith that 50 of the companions narrated that. And from those 50, the Ashal Mubashareen bil Jannah, the 10 who were promised Jannah, all of them narrated the hadith of Raf al Yadain. You are not, Abdullah, going to find too many hadith like that. Even if the hadith is mutawatir, many of the companions narrated it. But ten of the mubashireen with Jannah, so it is an issue that is established and it shouldn't be rejected at all. So we should raise 
our hands. Another issue about this, Khwani, is that the scholars of Islam, Ajma'een, with the exception of the people of Al Kufa, they all established you should do Raf'ul Yadain. It was such a, some, an issue that was so prevalent, so well known, that they all mentioned it. Al Imam Al Humaydi, the Sheikh of Al Imam Bukhari, Abdullah bin Zubayr Al Humaydi, Al Imam Al Awza'i, all of them, Al Imam Malik, all of them, Yahya bin Ma'in, Al Madini, Al Imam Ahmed, Al Imam Al Bukhari, Ibrahim ibn Rahuya, all of those scholars said Raf'ul Yadain is from the Sunnah. So there are some scholars, as I mentioned, from Al-Kufa, from the Hanafi Madhab, who are against it. And we say this is one of the issues that if a person wasn't careful, he wasn't balanced, it's these types of issues that make people upset with the people of the Madhab. Not the Madhab, but the people of the Madhab. Here it is, an issue that is crystal clear, and you people do what? All of the Madhab, the Hanabil, all of them, all of them. When a person is muta'asab, what they do is they reject authentic hadith or they put a spin to it like these politicians, Labour Party, Democrats, these people, they put spin to what happened. They'll explain it in a way that la yahtamil. So raf'al yadain should be done, ya akhi Abdullah, for the man and for the woman. Four places, raf'al yadain. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned, it is not permissible for anyone to abandon Raf'ul Yadain when he opens up his prayer and throughout the course of his prayer because of the many hadith that are clear in this particular issue. Next mistake, Khwani, is the mistake of some of our brothers from West Africa and certain parts of Africa who are on the Maliki Medhat, who send their arms down. They have the Isbal Al Yadain. When they pray, they pray with their hands down to the side. There's a mistake in the prayer. Yesterday, I went to a brother's place in Oldbury to do some tapes for the Oldbury Foundation, the Dawah organization that they have. And after or before, we went to pray Salat al-Maghrib in the masjid. So I had my first opportunity to meet the brothers from Gambia in that masjid there, the Gambia masjid. I was impressed because the Pakistani brothers that I was going with, on my way, I heard many things about the masjid. They've been asking me, come give the khutbah there. I had an opp- didn't have an opportunity. Those Pakistani brothers, they told me, Wallahi, those brothers over there, they give you love. They give us love. Although we're Pakistani and things like that, we don't feel like we're not connected. They make us feel that that is our masjid. I've had experience in some of these masajid in this city and other than this city. These people who are from different parts of the world, I don't want to mention, but you go in that masjid, they don't make you feel like you even belong. And I mentioned that many times. I went to that masjid, alhamdulillah, may will do when I went upstairs. I was walking to the saf, and I could see Raf al Yadain was something that the vast majority of them were doing. And they're from West Africa. Why are they doing that? Although it goes against what their grandfathers did, it goes against what some of them perceived as being the correct salah. They're doing that because some of the brothers from Gambia are taking their time, giving dawah to their elders, giving dawah to their community. So I've been in certain Muslim countries. I've been to Sudan in East Africa, where they're Maliki. been to Morocco and different places. You'll get your head chopped off if you go into some of these messages practicing the sunnah. If you go to Pakistan... And you say, I mean, in some masjids, they'll pick you up and throw you outside of the masjid on your head. So leave off, I mean. Leave off of the issue. If it's from the sunnah, it's going to cause problems. So concerning this issue of praying with your hands down, for our brothers who are from West Africa or the Maliki Medhat, this is a mistake. This is a mistake. The Prophet ﷺ said, Umirna. All of the prophets, all of them, from Adam all the way to Isa ibn Maryam, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim. And then after them, the culmination is our Nabi al-Mustafa al-Mushtaba, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of the prophets and the messengers, they used to pray. They were ordered to do three things, all of them. And the very first thing he said, 
they were ordered to grab their left hands with their right hands in prayer. All of them. So this is established. And Imam Malik, the one who the people who are in the Maliki Medhab said, we follow him, his Medhab and his fiqh. And Imam Malik himself, in his book Al Muwatta, his book of Al Hadith, Al Muwatta, in that book is this hadith that I just mentioned. We've been commanded to hold our left hands with our right hands in salah. We've been commanded when it's time to break your fast at Maghrib time, hurry up and break your fast. We've been commanded that you should delay the suhoor when you want to fast, delay the suhoor as close to fajr as possible, which goes to pro- show all of the prophets pray salat and all of the prophets sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they fasted in the month of Ramadan. They fasted and they had al-iftar and they had a suhoor So when Imam Malik did it, it is true and it is mentioned that Imam Malik, the Khalifa during his time was Al-Mansur, who was a tough person. It is true that Imam Malik was imprisoned and this Khalifa used to try to force Imam Malik to take positions. For an example, he would say, I want you to give a fatwa, I want you to give a verdict that anyone in the Muslim empire who doesn't give me the bayat, his marriage is batil, null and void. So you people are married right now and you're living during that time. He wanted El Imam Malik to tell you in the masjid because he knows all of the people, their hearts are with the ulama, especially El Imam Malik. And they're coming from all over the Muslim world to meet El Imam Malik in Al Medina. One of the few Imams, Al Imam Malik, he didn't travel anywhere. He didn't go to Mecca, he didn't go to Egypt, didn't go to Al Iraq, he didn't go to Bukhara, didn't go to Khurasan. Al Imam Malik didn't travel anywhere. And Imam Ahmed traveled all over the place, all the way to Baghdad. He went all the way to Al Yemen, went everywhere, those scholars. And Imam Malik stayed right there in Medina, and the dunya came to him. So people from all over the Muslim world are coming to him. The Khalifa and Mansur al Safah, they called him a Safah, the shedder of blood, of blood. He wanted him to make a fatwa, tell the people, hey, you people, if you don't recognize him as the Khalifa and give him the bayah, and don't go against him and oppose him. If you do that, if you go against him, your marriage is null and void. And Imam Malik said, I'm not doing that. He was of the opinion that the people should support him and obey him, but to give a fatwa, there's no delil on that. They're wrong for what they're doing, ya Khalifa. They're wrong if they don't give you the bayah. If they want to make khuruj against you and oppose you and revolt against you, they're wrong. But for me to give a, a fatwa because he disagrees with you, then these people are no longer married. There's no deal for that. Wallahi, if some of the sheikhs today said that to the people, we'll have people who would believe that. If certain sheikhs said today, anyone who doesn't see me as the carrier of the flag of a jah with ta'adil, they, we'll have people who be, they'll believe stuff like that. So when Imam Malik was imprisoned and he was beaten and his shoulder blade was broken. As a result of that, when he used to pray, he used to pray with his arms down. His arm down. He couldn't hold his arm up. So instead of the people following Al-Imam Al-A'zam, Al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they followed Al-Imam Malik and what he did out of necessity. His condition was like that. Rahimahullahu Ta'ala. So the latter people of the Maliki Madhab, they were the people on this. The Muta'akhirun from the Malikiyin, the later people. As for the first people, they themselves used to bring the dalil that you have to do this because they were upon the sunnah. And from the dalil that they used to use was the surah, Inna Tainaka al Kawthar, Fasalli li Rabbika walhar. We gave you the Kawthar, Ya Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So pray to your Lord, Walhar. And Nahar means to slaughter the camel at the neck, a Nahar. Allahumma inna naj'aluka fi nuhurihim. When you're going to go into a city, and there is an enemy, someone you're afraid of, you make the dua, Oh Allah, I put you in their necks, a nahar. So they use that ayat. For salli li rabbika, pray to your Lord, one har, and put your hand up on your chest by your neck. They use that ayat as a dalil. So the beginning people of the Malikiyah, they were upon that. The latter people, they were not upon that. So this is a mistake for our African brothers our brothers who are from other parts of the Muslim world. And there should be no khilaf in that particular issue. 
also from the mistakes of Khwani is the mistake of abandoning the dua al istiftah and the isti'adha. When a person is going to pray, Allahu Akbar, he shouldn't just start reading the Quran. He should do the dua al istiftah, and it's important. The Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anyone who he is present for 40 prayers. 40 prayers. And he does not miss the dua of an istiftah. He gets so much virtues. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will make intercession for him. He'll get so many rewards. So some people, they go to Mecca and Medina, and they make this hadith only for Mecca or only for Medina. They have to be in the masjid for 40 prayers, which is eight days you have to be in the masjid. No, that's here in Birmingham. If you make 40 prayers in any masjid in the dunya, the small masjid that those Gambians have, any masjid, 40 prayers, then you'll get those rewards. But the dua, the hadith said, that you make it before the imam starts reading al-fatiha. So you have to be there doing the dua al-istiftah. So the Prophet wasallam he had many dua al-istiftah. Many. وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ حَنِيفًا So many. Some people just stick to the one of Umar, the short one, the easy one. No problem, you can do that. But as we mentioned many times, Shaykh al-Islam al-Thani, Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn al-Qayyim said, when you look at the way the Prophet prayed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did things in different ways. He did the same thing in different ways. He would do the same thing in different ways. Reading the Quran in different ways, making different dua, doing different things, the same thing but in different ways. He said one of the wisdoms behind that is so that the person doesn't become used to the prayer. It just becomes something that's mechanic. But when he changes it up and does it, he keeps the prayer alive. He keeps himself interested. So learn the different dua and don't do the same thing the same way all the time. What he did a lot, you do it a lot. What he did sometimes, you do it sometimes. So the dua al-istiftah should not be left. And al-isti'adha, before you read, you should make al-isti'adha. Due to the mentioning of that in the Quran, فَإِذَا قَرَتَّ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ If you read the Quran, then seek protection in Allah. Now this is something I want to bring to your attention and many, many people are not aware of it concerning the prayer. From the Shafi'i al-Madhat, from the Shafi'i al-Madhat, is that any time you're going to pray, whenever you start and you begin and you're going to read the Quran in the first rakat, when you get up for the second, third, fourth rakat, you should make al-isti'adha billahi ta'ala. So you're going to start Allahu Akbar, and then you're going to say Subhanak and you're going to go through whatever the dua istifta that you use. Then you're going to say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. You're going to read Surah Al-Fatiha. Then you're going to read what is easy for you from the Quran. Allahu Akbar. And you're going to record. Then you come up. You go to Sajda, Jalsa, Sajda. And you get up for Qiyam. You should say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Because the ayat is general. The ayat said if you read the Qur'an, seek refuge in Allah from his shaitan. It's a general ayat. When you read the Qur'an, seek refuge in Allah from his shaitan. So, Al-Imam Ibn Hazm Al-Andalusi, one of the tremendous scholars in Al-Islam, he wrote a book called Kitab Al-Muhalla. Tremendous book on the Zahiri Madhab. The Madhab of taking things apparently. It was a good Madhab, but he did say some things that were a problem. Because when you take things apparently all the time, it can be a problem. But nonetheless, he made an intisar to this madhat, to this position. And it is a strong position. That any time you get up from the salah in whatever rakat, second, third, fourth, before you read Surah Al-Fatiha, say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. And then read, because Allah Ta'ala commanded that. If you read the Qur'an, they seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal from the Shaitan Rajim. The next mistake, Ikhwani, is the mistake of raising your eyes to the sky, 
looking at the imam, looking at the person who is in front of you, when you go into rukur, looking between your legs, even some people looking behind their legs, this is a big problem in the prayer. That if you were to look at the Muslims while they were praying, you would see the ajabul ujab. If you were looking, they're facing you, you'll see this guy really looking at you. You guys are laughing. This is the condition of our ummah. The people are looking all over the place. That's a mistake in the prayer. The companions describe the salat of al-Mustafa al-Mujtaba, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya ummat al-Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was dying, and when he was dying, he came to the masjid, he saw his companions were praying, and he was sick, and he was in a lot of pain. But when he saw them praying in the jamaat, the way he taught them, he became enthused, and he began to smile, because he knew, if these people hang on to this prayer, inshallah, they're going to be okay. But we abandoned that prayer, and those who make it, they don't make it the right way. So they said that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he made the salat, he would look at the place where he's going to make sajda. And you look at the place of sajda throughout the prayer. The only time you don't look at that place is when you're in a tashahud, at tahiyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. He will put his finger like this, or put his finger like that, and he will look at that finger. And he said, lahi ashaddu ala shaitan min al-hadid. When you do this, pointing, La ilaha illallah, tawheed, al-ubudiyah, then it is more harder on shaitan than you being able to hit him with iron or something like this. So he would look at his finger. That's the only time he took his eyes away from the place of a sajda. And it's a major sin to look around. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as our mother said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she asked him, where should the person look? If the person is looking around. What would you have to say about that, Ya Rasulullah? The person is looking around in the salat. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, huwa ikhtilas, yakhtalisu al-shaytanu min salat al-abdi. When a person is looking around, this is a shaytan ripping him off, stealing from his prayer. Still him from the reward and the virtues of his prayer when he's not looking at the right place, looking at people here, looking at people there. So his shaitan is ripping him off and robbing him on a daily basis. In another hadith, he mentions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ما بال أقوام يرفعون أبصارهم من السماء في صلاتهم What is wrong with some people who are looking up in the sky while they're praying? What are you looking in the sky for? What is wrong with these people looking in the sky while they're praying? They're Bedouins. They don't know. They're munafiqun. They don't know. They're not serious about the prayer. And then he will be shadid with them in that. Why are you looking in the sky? So he told them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَيَنْتَهُنَّ عَنْ ذَلِكَ أَوْ لَتُخْتَفُنَّ أَبْصَارُهُمْ If they don't stop doing that, it may be that their eyesight will be taken away. The great scholar of Islam, Imam Ibn Hajar, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, when he explained these hadith, about the impermissibility of looking around inside Bukhari, he said that there was a sheikh, either from his sheikh or one of the ulama of Islam, the people used to go to take knowledge from him, and he used to give his knowledge from behind the veil. And when Ibn Hajar or someone, I don't remember exactly, either Ibn Hajar, and I think it was Ibn Hajar, when he outstripped and surpassed all of the other students and he got close with the sheikh and the sheikh saw his level they used to spend time alone so it was an opportunity for him to finally meet the sheikh see the sheikh so when the hijab was removed he had a face that looked like the face of a donkey he said well what happened he said I used to look in around in the prayer that may be true that name may not be true it's from the kalam of the salaf Ibn Hajar is sadiq thiqa indana but the kalam of the Nabi is enough for us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that a person may be rendered blind. Something may happen to him because he's not using his eyesight for the right thing. So look at the place of the salah. Unless you have a reason, unless you have a reason to look around. If you have a reason, then it's permissible. Let dorora. You're praying and your child is moving, you can look. There was a situation where the companions were traveling in jihad 
and the danger was imminent. They didn't know where the non-Muslims were, where the enemy was. When they started praying, the Prophet felt and he sensed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some movement in this direction from the bushes. While he was praying, he looked in that direction. And the people looked at him and they looked in that direction. And when he saw that nothing was happening, there was no threat, he turned back. So if an individual has a reason, an Islam goes along with the fitrah. The last thing that we want to mention concerning the eyes is closing the eyes is a mistake in the salat. The Prophet ﷺ did not close his eyes. And the proof of that is so many. The little sheep wanted to walk in front of him. He stopped the sheep. ﷺ. His grandson, Hassan, Hussein, they were about to get into something. He picked them up while he was praying. Umama picked his granddaughter up. Umama, so the child wouldn't become hurt. He وسلم, was praying the shaitan, a jinn, tried to walk in front of him. He grabbed him, choked him. And the companions saw all of this. He told us, وسلم, if a snake comes in front of you, if a scorpion comes in front of you, while you're praying, you can kill it. So if you're there with your eyes closed, you're going to not be able to kill a snake or a scorpion because your eyes is closed. So closing your eyes is not from the sunnah, something that should be avoided. But the scholars were not rough and tough and hardcore in this issue because they know the masalih of this religion. It's the ignorant people who are rough and tough and hardcore. Make the religion difficult for everyone. The sunnah said, and that's how you have to do it. Yeah, sometimes it's like that. But sometimes in the issue there is al-ittisar. It's easy. Take it easy. There are some people who if they close their eyes, they can concentrate a little bit more. Some people like that. If they keep their eyes open, they'll be distracted. Closing their eyes, they listen to that Quran and they're in a better position. Those some scholars said, if this is your condition, then inshallah it's permissible. But it's something that's disliked. When they asked Al Imam Ahmed about closing your eyes in the salat, he said that's from the action of the Yahud. It's like when you read the Quran and memorize the Quran. You tell someone, your wife, your child, read the Quran. They start to read and they start doing like this. He can't help it. She can't help it. It's just something you do. It's involuntary. That's the ibadah of the Yahud at the so-called well and wall, at the well and wall. So these are the issues we want to present to you brothers today. And there are many, many issues to come, inshallah. Take care of the prayer. Be careful with the prayer. Barakallahu feekum wa asalullahi alaykum. Naktafi bihada qadr wa nasallaha ta'ali wa thaqina wa iyaakum. Lima yuhibbu yarda wa mimma yuhibbuhu Allahu ta'ala salat al-abd. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته